The Appropriations Subcommittee on Agriculture, Rural Development, Food and Drug Administration, and Related Agencies will now come to order. Welcome to Chair DeLora, Ranking Member Granger, Ranking Member Harris, and the subcommittee members who are here in person and those participating by secure video teleconference. Before I move to my opening statement, I'd like to offer a brief explanation of how this markup will work. As I mentioned, some members have opted to use secure video teleconferencing, which will allow them to participate remotely. For those on video conference, once you start speaking, there will be a slight delay before you are displayed on the main screen. Speaking into the microphone activates the camera, displaying the speaker on the main screen. Do not stop your remarks if you do not immediately see the screen switch. If the screen does not change after several seconds, please make sure that you are not muted. To minimize background now noise and ensure the correct speaker is being displayed, we ask that members who are participating by video remain on mute unless you have sought recognition. In terms of the speaking order, we will follow our traditional order beginning with the chair and ranking member of the subcommittee, then the chair and ranking member of the full committee, and then any other members who may wish to speak. Finally, we've set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups, including documents to be inserted in the record by unanimous consent, by amendments, by motions or other unanimous consent requests, and so on. That email address has been provided to your staff. I would remind all members that they must verbally request unanimous consent out loud, as well as sending the document or written unanimous consent request to the email address. Before us is the chairman's mark for the fiscal year 2023 Agriculture, Rural Development, Food and Drug Administration, and Related Agencies Appropriations Bill. The bill and the accompanying report have been a huge undertaking in a short amount of time, and I'm incredibly proud of the work that we've done. Let me take a moment to express my gratitude for the ranking member of the subcommittee, Dr. Harris. I continue to enjoy the opportunity to work with you, Dr. Harris, uh, to produce a strong bill, and I think that we have together done that. Uh, today, we are considering a bill which touches the lives of every single American. We all eat the food, rely on the medicine and medical devices, and use the fibers and materials made possible and kept safe by this bill. This bill's investments in our rural communities, as well as the institutions that develop our agricultural sector and safeguard our medicine and food, are vital to our country's well-being. This year, our subcommittee held five hearings, including one with USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack and another with FDA Commissioner Califf. We also held a hearing on the infant formula crisis in which we heard from four witnesses on how the crisis is impacting families and local grocery stores. Our fiscal 2023 Allocation is $27.2 billion, compared to the fiscal year 2022 enacted level of $25.125 billion, which is an 8.3% increase. The bill continues to invest in key agency-wide priorities, including investments to ensure equitable participation in USDA programs, address the impacts of climate change, and enhance staff and leadership offices at USDA. Supporting our rural communities means uh, it remains a top priority. And in total, the bill provides more than $4.2 billion in budget authority for rural development programs to fund critical infrastructure, such as water and wastewater systems and rural housing needs. The bill invests more than $545 million for rural broadband expansion, including $450 million for the ReConnect program. The bill creates two new lending programs for hard-to-reach communities. The first, 
offers a 1% interest rate on water and waste disposal loan projects in distressed areas, making these desperately needed improvements more financially viable for distressed communities. The second program is designed to improve home lending opportunities for Native American tribes, where traditionally lending has been both difficult and complex. These efforts will further maximize rural development programs within the communities they are intended to serve. The bill also provides over $3.1 billion for farm and conservation programs. This includes $61 million to resolve ownership and succession of farmland issues, also known as the heirs' property issue, which predominantly affects black farmers and has led to the loss of millions and millions of acres of privately held farmland. The bill provides an historic level of funding for agricultural research, including $500 million for the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative, which is the highest level ever. And I'm proud of the investments we make in our 1890 and 1994 land grant universities and our Hispanic serving institutions, all of which are significantly over their 2022 levels. The bill continues our steadfast commitment to our country's long tradition of humanitarian assistance by including $1.8 billion for the Food for Peace grants and $265 million for the McGovern Dole program. Both of these are historic highs. The bill fully funds the SNAP, Child Nutrition and WIC programs to meet expected participation in FY 2023. The bill also provides additional protections for SNAP recipients by providing a such sums appropriation for the fourth quarter of the fiscal year uh, to ensure the SNAP program does not run out of money. In this bill, we provide $3.66 billion for the Food and Drug Administration. Within this total, there are several important investments, including increases to address the opioid crisis and for ALS treatments, foreign unannounced inspections, and the Office of Minority Health. The bill provides $7 million in support of the administration's cancer moonshot and fully funds the request for work on chemicals in human food. And finally, the community project funding requests. The bill provides funding for 134 projects, totaling over $192 million. I ask for your support of this bill. I want to thank my personal staff, uh, Kenneth Cutts, Tanisha Boomer, Julian Johnson, Jonathan Halpern, and Jack Bryan. And I'd also like to thank the subcommittee staff, our clerk, Martha Foley, Jen Lim Jones, Perry Yates, Joe Lehman, Justin Masucci, Dallas Sell, and Yana Samora. Also, Pam Miller of the minority staff. I'd like to thank them all for their extraordinary work on the bill. I'd like to also thank the ranking member, Dr. Harris, for his strong leadership, his support, and his cooperation in helping us craft what I believe is an extraordinary work product. Thank you for your valuable input. Uh, with that, I now recognize ranking member of the subcommittee, Dr. Harris. And Dr. Harris, I will yield to you for any remarks that you would like to make at this time. Thank you, Chairman Bishop. I want to recognize the work that you and the staff have done in crafting the fiscal year 2023 agriculture appropriation bill that it's before us today. There are a number of programs and provisions in this bill that I support, such as funding for rural broadband programs, rural electrification and telecommunication loan programs, critical research programs, and protections to ensure we have safe food, drugs, and medical devices. I also want to thank you and the committee for working with me to assist my state of Maryland in achieving their environmental and Chesapeake Bay restoration goals by allowing seafood processors to more easily produce a safe product while avoiding duplicative regulatory burdens. While there are many things to like about this bill, the total discretionary spending level of $27.2 billion, or an 8% increase over the previous year's funding, 
does not acknowledge the economic reality that our nation faces. As Americans are all too aware, inflation is soaring at a 40-year high of 8.6 percent, and the U.S. economy shrank by 1.5 percent last quarter. Gas prices have hit a record $5 a gallon nationwide, and food prices rose 12 percent, the largest 12-month increase since 1979. More governmental spending only ends in higher prices for the American people and adds to the inflation problem created by the Biden administration's reckless spending. Increases across the board are included in this bill, most notably for the Food and Drug Administration, which would receive an overwhelming and unnecessary 10 percent increase. Just a few weeks ago, this subcommittee held hearings on the infant formula crisis with the FDA commissioner. From those hearings, it's clear that strong leadership is needed at FDA, not a significant increase in funding. Rather than being held accountable, the FDA is being rewarded with more funding. The bill also continues the increase for the WIC fruit and vegetable benefit. These increased benefits began as a one-time increase in the American Rescue Plan with no discussion or input from Republicans. I understand the importance of making sure WIC participants have access to fruit and vegetables, but this policy and funding change was not debated and agreed to by both parties. This bill simply continues a program that was meant to be temporary without regard to the inflationary pressures and soaring food prices already squeezing taxpayers. I'm also extremely concerned about providing the administration with unlimited spending authority for the SNAP program at the end of the fiscal year. The administration claims this authority is needed for an unexpected increase in SNAP participation, yet the president continues to tout record low unemployment rates, which should translate into a decrease in SNAP participation. Furthermore, the program has a reserve fund of $9 billion, so providing USDA with a blank check seems just irrational and irresponsible. Along the same line, I'm concerned by a Politico article published last week that stated USDA is exploring using $1 billion from the Commodity Credit Corporation, or CCC, to backdoor funds to schools after Congress did not extend COVID waivers for school nutrition programs. There were discussions to extend the waivers held outside of this committee, but ultimately a decision was made not to extend the waivers as part of the fiscal year 22 omnibus. My concern is that the Biden administration is using the CCC as a slush fund to circumvent congressional decisions and fund activities that have not been authorized. This is not the purpose of CCC authorities and funding, and I'll be closely watching the actions of USDA. If the administration chooses to use CCC funds to circumvent Congress, and specifically this committee's Article I powers of the purse, it may be time to reconsider whether such sums spending authority is appropriate for the CCC going forward. In times like these, as stewards of taxpayer dollars, we must make tough decisions in the greater interest of the American people. While I support a number of programs in the bill, I simply cannot support the bill at this overall spending level. Mr. Chairman, this bill touches the lives of every American, and I'm hopeful that we can find common ground going forward to support America's farmers, ranchers, and rural communities. I look forward to working with you, Chairman Bishop, Chair DeLauro, and Ranking Member Granger as this process moves forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Harris. At this time, I am delighted to yield such time as she may consume uh, to the Chair of the Full Committee, Ms. DeLauro, for any opening remarks that she may have. And Madam Chair, let me thank you for your very outstanding leadership of the Appropriations Committee are taking us through this very, very difficult process. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Laura, you are now recognized. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, as well to Ranking Member Harris uh, uh, for your bipartisan efforts on this bill. I want to also say a thank you uh, to the subcommittee staff for their work in drafting this bill. I just want to say that the appropriations process is well underway. This is the fourth subcommittee hearing that we've held today. We will do two more tomorrow. We will wrap up subcommittee next week and move to full committee next week. So we're meeting our deadline of getting all the subcommittee and full committee meetings done in, uh, in June and that we can bring our bills to the floor in July. Uh, but about this bill, this bill has the power to ensure every consumer, our farmers, our ranchers, our rural communities, 
We can make sure that they're supported and that they can access safe, accessible, and a resilient food supply that they deserve. I am proud that the bill builds on uh, the 2022 government spending package with an increase of over $2 billion over last year. With the investments in that bill, we proved how our government can serve American families, trying to put food on the table. We continue that work now. This bill continues that progress, it helps ensure 6.2 million low-income women, infants, and children will access safe and healthy foods, including fruits and vegetables, with $6 billion for the WIC program. It provides the 42 million Americans eligible for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, the food stamp benefits of the support that they need with over $111 billion in mandatory spending for the food stamp program. The bill provides $100 million for the storage and distribution of USDA foods distributed through the Emergency Food Assistance Program, the TFAP network of emergency feeding organizations, the highest level in the program's history. We are investing in the health and the well-being of America's kids and our schools through child nutrition programs like school meals. This will fund roughly 5.6 billion school lunches and snacks. That is 5.6 billion times a child in this country will not have to go hungry or wonder where their next meal is coming from. And yes, we will be working to doing something about extending the waivers of the, of the school meals program so kids in our country do not have to go hungry during their summer months or beyond. Fighting hunger at home, and that's what we are doing, is fighting hunger because we know that hunger has increased in the United States, and with the abundance of food that we have, no child, no adult should go hungry in the United States of America. But fighting hunger at home is not enough, so we're providing historic funding for international food assistance programs, including $1.8 billion for Food for Peace grants and $265 million for the McGovern Dole program. As we ensure access to nutritious food, we must also ensure our nation's food supply is safe. As the recent contamination of infant formula further highlighted, our food safety infrastructure must be robust and our food supply must be safeguarded. And I want to um, uh, acknowledge the leading role that the chair, uh, Chairman Bishop, has taken on uh, uh, dealing with the issue of infant formula and uh, the hearings that he's held so that we can address that because, in fact, no family should have to uh, be worried about the supply of infant formula and, and as well as the safety of that infant formula. With over $3.6 billion in discretion, discretionary funding for the Food and Drug Administration, we provide new resources so that the FDA can enhance its efforts to keep our food safe, including protecting baby food, responding to food outbreaks, monitoring the supply chain, improving inspections, and conducting oversight of domestic and foreign drug manufacturers. Because we recognize a dangerous gap and the need for more FDA inspection staff, we are ensuring the FDA has the resources and the personnel to conduct inspection, inspections and thoroughly review infant formula application and the manufacturing contracts. This bill builds on the efforts um, by this committee uh, through the House passed supplemental appropriation and the oversight activities to address this unacceptable and preventable crisis. In that vein, we provide nearly one point, uh, almost $1.2 billion for food safety and inspection programs to support the programs and personnel that ensure our food is safe and to provide support for small and very small producers. With market consolidation impacting our food supply, including in the meatpacking, cereal, and infant formula industries, these efforts are uh, more important now than effort. And rural communities need our support, which is why we are providing over $4.2 billion for rural development programs. Through rural housing loans and rental assistance, we will help 140,000 families keep a roof over their heads. 
We are supporting low-income families, older Americans, and historically underserved Native American tribes access affordable housing. We continue expanding broadband services to improve the health, economic, and educational opportunities of rural Americans. And as we do so, we will invest in other critical infrastructure, including $1.5 billion for rural water, and waste program loans and over $680 million grants for drinking water and sanitary waste disposal systems. I'm proud of the bill before us because its impact will have a profound um, uh, impact and it will reach every single American. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation and th again thank those who made it possible and yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And at this time, I'd like to yield to the ranking member of the committee, the full committee, Ms. Granger, for any remarks that she may have. And thank you for your leadership and your cooperation in helping us discharge our constitutional responsibility with respect to appropriations for this nation. Uh, you are now recognized, Ms. Granger. Thank you, uh, Chairman Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's going to be that funds agriculture, rural development, and the Food and Drug Administration. I also want to recognize the hard work of the acting ranking member of the subcommittee, Dr. Harris. I appreciate both of you working to fund priorities of members on both sides of the aisle. While this bill funds many important programs, it's based on a funding level that passed the House without Republican support. In addition to concerns about spending, I have a few examples of what must be carefully reviewed as we, as this particular bill moves through the process. First, the bill includes language essentially giving the administration unlimited spending authority for a nutrition program that was already dramatically expanded during the pandemic. At a time when our nation's spending is at an all-time high, we should be finding ways to rein in spending rather than writing a blank check. Many of us are frustrated by the lack of leadership at the FDA in addressing critical food safety-related issues, specifically the instant formula recall and shortage. Instead of holding the agency accountable, this bill provides a significant increase for the FDA that will go to hire more of the same bureaucrats that missed the problem in the first place. It's abundantly clear the FDA needs strong leadership and providing more funds will not fix this problem. Our committee has given large increases in the past, and to this day, we still do not know how these funds were, have been used. This will be more of the same, wasteful government spending without results. Some other programs in this bill receive double-digit percentage increases that will grow the size of the federal government, yet the bill does nothing to help farmers and ranchers who are struggling with record high costs for things like fuel and fertilizer. This will not help the American family struggling with record high grocery prices. In spite of our differences, we will work together as this process moves forward to ensure this important bill is signed into law. We're committed to supporting our farmers and ranchers expanding internet coverage into rural areas and ensuring that our drugs and medical devices are safe and effective. Both sides will have to agree to leave our controversial provisions and set more reasonable funding levels to get there. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to continuing to work with you and Chair DeLauro as we move forward, and thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Granger. Are there any other members who wish to be recognized? Hearing none, let me ask if any member would like to have an amendment they wish to offer. If not, I'd like to recognize Ms. Pingree for a motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to report the bill favorably to the full committee. The question is on the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All aye. those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be permitted to make technical and conforming changes to the measure that was just approved. And as a reminder to members, please leave all copies of the bill and reports in the room. Without objection, this meeting is now adjourned.